right, Revelation chapter 10, a book that is meant for eating. You know, some things in life you have to develop a taste for. Wouldn't you agree with that? Um, onions are a great example of that. Most kids do not like onions. Most kids don't. Uh, some children do, but most don't. Coffee is another one. Okay, we're still trying to get David to develop a taste for coffee. He, he, he won't touch it. Um, but that's okay. He's, he's, he's a Minnesotan now. And so sooner or later, it will get you. Um, another one, really hot peppers. Really hot peppers, okay? Now, that is not a matter of developing taste. It's a matter of insanity. But that's, that's a whole other thing. And I can't help but think of uh, Andy on that. He likes those really hot peppers, as does Caden. Caden likes them too, doesn't he? Okay. See, it runs in the family. I mean, insanity runs in the family, I guess. <laughs> but, um, but anyways, no, you can, you can enjoy that. But, you know, those things are, it's an issue of developing a taste for that. Um, well, we're talking today about eating a book. God has a command in scriptures here for John to eat a book. You might say, what in the world is that talking about? Well, that's where we're going with this. Now, let me say, as we get into chapter 10, chapter 10, verse 1 through chapter 11, verse 14, is another passage that what we would call parenthetical in our study in Revelation. In other words, uh, God is saying he's gotten, we've gotten to a point in our study, and God says, okay, now just wait a minute. Let me tell you about something. Let me set the stage, and then we'll continue. We'll pick up where we left off. There's a few places in Revelation that are that way, and this is one of them. They take us from the end of the sixth trumpet judgment to a heavenly scene, and then we will continue on to the seventh trumpet judgment. All right? Revelation 10, verse 1, it says, And I saw, this is John writing, And I saw a, a, a mighty angel, another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his feet was, as it were, the sun, and his feet as pillars, or his face was, as it were, the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot upon the earth. And that's a mighty big angel, wouldn't you say? And cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth, and when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. Okay, now, as I mentioned through our study, there are certain things in Revelation that we, we, uh, we look at it, we compare Scripture with Scripture, then we come up with an interpretation. Some of those interpretations we can't be absolutely sure of. This is one where commentators vary widely as far as who or what this angel is. Um, I'm going to give you what I believe, and I'm going to give you the reasons why I believe it this morning. Who is this angel? Well, let us remember that the word angel in the Bible is, is literally the word messenger. And it can mean anyone from a man, as we see in Revelation 2 and 3, the angel's the messenger to the churches. I believe those are the pastors of the churches there. It can mean anything from a man to God to an angelic being, you know, like you think of Gabriel or Michael. Um, so it could be any of those. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ is seen manifested in the Old Testament many times as the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord. Now, while we can't be totally sure, I personally believe this angel or messenger is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And I'm going to give you some reasons why. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute. Would, would God be a, a messenger? Well, sure, he would be a messenger. Didn't Jesus come with a message when he came the first time? He came with a message, didn't he? He had a lot to say when he came the, the first time. But why do I believe this is referring to Jesus? Well, the first thing is this. You notice he is clothed with a cloud. Now, clouds often in Scripture accompany divine presence. It accompanies divine presence. Um, hold your place and look at chapter 1, uh, Revelation chapter 1. 
just a few pages to your left. It says in Revelation 1, verse 7, it says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. This is referring to Jesus. And all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. All right, so he, here we see in Revelation chapter 10, he is clothed with a cloud. We see in chapter 1, he comes with clouds. Uh, clouds, again, many times a reference or symbolic of divine presence. Now, secondly, you notice a rainbow was upon his head. Now, what is a rainbow? Well, we know God is the one who invented the rainbow, okay? Jesse Jackson did not, all right? John is the one who invented, or, or sorry, the Lord is the one who invented the rainbow. We see that the rainbow first appears after the flood. The rainbow is a symbol of God's promises. God's promises. We saw in, in Revelation chapter 4, verse 2, it said, And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and sardin stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. So a rainbow, this, this angelic being that we see in chapter 10, a rainbow is around his head. Let's go, let's look at another description here in chapter 10. His face was like the sun. Now, this one really points, I believe, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Back in, again in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 16, it said, and he had in his right hand seven stars. Now, this is referring to Jesus. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his or its strength. So here in, in chapter 10, his face was like the sun. Chapter 1, verse 16, his countenance was as the sun that shineth. All of these things very, very uh, much falling in line with uh, characteristics or manifestations of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you remember the Mount of Transfiguration? Do you remember there in Matthew chapter 17? It says, it talked about Jesus, and, and it says, and he was transfigured before them, and his face did shine like what? The sun, the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Now, by the way, some commentators, it, it's kind of interesting, they'll say, and I'm okay with it, again, uh, we can't be totally sure here in chapter 10, but they'll say, well, this is not Jesus, but this is an angel with all the characteristics of him. Okay, I guess that's possible. Um, you know, an angel representing the Lord, and he has all the characteristics of the Lord. Why not just believe it's the Lord himself? All right, let's move on. You notice his feet were like pillars of fire. Now, fire in Scripture, and as we've already seen this, fire is a sign of divine judgment and trial. Fire is a sign of divine judgment and trial. Again, do you remember back in chapter 1, in verses 14 and 15, where it said, his head and his hairs were, were white as wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they were, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice is the sound of many waters. All right? Another characteristic here of this mighty angel that's referred to in chapter 10, it says he has a loud voice like that of a, what, lion roaring. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, it wasn't that long ago that we saw in chapter 5 and verse 5, Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, he, was the, he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Revelation 5, 5, and one of the elders saith unto me, weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Now this next one, I believe, is a very strong indicator that this mighty angel that we find in chapter 10 is the Lord Jesus Christ, and it is this. 
The two witnesses that we are going to see next week in chapter 11, in verse 3, the two witnesses are said to be this angel's witnesses, and he gives them power. Okay? So the angel, the, the, the two witnesses are the witnesses of the angel, and the angel gives the witnesses power. Now, I don't know of one angel in the Bible who does that, but I know the Lord does that. And by the way, look at that with me, Revelation 11, verse 3. And I, and this is the angel speaking, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred threescore days clothed in sackcloth. By the way, those numbers right there, that's 1,260 days. That just happens to be half of the tribulation. Half of the tribulation. All right? So who is this messenger that we find in chapter 10? I believe it is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. But secondly, let's move on now to the little book that we see in Revelation 10, verse 2. It says, And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth. Now, again, I don't know of any angel that big. However, the Lord, that would be indicative of the Lord Jesus Christ claiming the authority over the earth, both the land and the sea. Now, what is in the little book? Well, again, we can speculate, but there, I think there's some biblical speculation we can make on this. I believe that it, is, that it simply contains the remaining truth found in the book of Revelation that God wants us to know. Now, we see it in verses 8 through 10. Now, let me say this, though, emphatically. This is not the seven-seal scroll. This is something separate from that. It is separate from that. And under this, uh, when, when we see this in this passage, you notice he sets one foot on the sea and another on the earth. Again, it's a picture of his dominance. It's a picture of his conquering power. Uh, he, he will be, the Lord will be victorious. And folks, as the book of Revelation goes on, the Lord Jesus Christ continues to take back the earth for his rule and his reign during the kingdom age of the millennium, the thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth. And this becomes clear, by the way, at the end of chapter 11. Now, now let me pause and just mention something in here, all right? For those of you who haven't been with us through this study, we are today living in what we call the church age, the church age, or the dispensation of grace. How long is that period of time? We don't know for sure, because if we did know for sure, we would know exactly when Jesus Christ was coming back. But we don't know that. I, I believe it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,000 years. All right, We are living in the church age. The church age in the Old Testament was a mystery. It was not a truth revealed. So you'll never see the church age in the Old Testament. The church age is something where we're living today, and it was not manifested until the days of the apostles. All right? Uh, the day of Pentecost, I believe that's when the church age began, and it'll go to the rapture of the church. Now, it was revealed to Peter. It was really revealed to the apostle Paul and then to the other apostles. But before that, no one knew about it. Yes, not even in the Gospels did they understand the church. Now, that doesn't mean the church was not mentioned, okay, but no one understood what it meant because the word church simply means a called-out assembly a called out assembly. So we are living in what's called the church age today. The church age is going to end with something we call the rapture of the church. That's when Jesus comes back, okay, in the clouds. By the way, there it is again, Jesus in clouds, divine presence. Jesus comes back in the clouds, and he is going to call all those who have trusted in him and him alone as Savior. He's going to call them out of the earth, and we are going to be caught up to meet the Lord, the Bible says, in the air. In the air. Okay? This is not the second coming to earth. This is the rapture of the church. The second coming to earth takes place at the end of the tribulation period. Now, 
When we meet the Lord in the air, shortly after that, the seven-year tribulation period begins. And that seven-year tribulation period was talked about in the Old Testament. So the church is like a parenthesis. You take it out, and then you put the Old Testament, and you put it right there with the tribulation period. Remember, the tribulation period is the, is the time of whose trouble? Jacob's trouble. Jacob had his name changed to Israel at the time of Israel's trouble. The worst time Israel has ever had. You might say worse than World War II and Holocaust? Worse than that. Worse than that. But the church will be in heaven during that seven-year tribulation period. At the end of that period, and by the way, the tribulation period is what we are in the middle of studying here in the book of Revelation. The, the, most of the book of Revelation deals with the tribulation period, chapter 6 through 19. At the end of the tribulation period, Jesus is going to come back, and we are going to come back with him riding white horses, all right? And he is going to touch down on the Mount of Olives. He's going to defeat the armies of the world. And then he is going to set up, there's a judgment there called the judgment of the nations. Then he is going to set up his thousand-year reign and rule on this planet. And we will be part of that. We will be part of that during that thousand years. Thousand years, it means the millennium. That's what uh, the millennium means. The word millennium means thousand years. Okay? So we'll be there during that millennium. Now, what Jesus is doing during the tribulation period is he is putting out one judgment after another, after another, okay? And in a sense, the seven-sealed scroll, in a sense, is, you might say, the uh, title deed to the earth. He is coming back to reclaim it because who, according to 2 Corinthians 4, is the God of this world right now? Satan is. Now God, the God of the Bible, okay, the one true God is overall, we understand that. But Satan is the God of this world. That's what the Bible says about him. He is controlling the system. See, that's why there's, there's such hatred for the things of Christ today in the world. It's because Satan hates Christianity. Satan hates the Lord. He hates Christianity because it has to do with who? The Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. And so we, we see this going on. So Jesus, as, as Revelation goes on, the Lord Jesus Christ continues to take back the earth for his rule and reign in the kingdom age, all right? And again, this becomes clear as we get into chapter 11. Now back to Revelation 10, verse 4. It says, And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. Kind of interesting. John knew what it was, and wait, don't write it down. Don't write it down yet. By the way, this voice is the voice of the Father. Verse 5, And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. But in the days, and that means uh, that time would, should not be delayed any further. In other words, we're going to continue on with the plan. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. Okay, now notice here, the Lord is the one responsible for the world and the universe that we live in. Did you, did you notice that in, in, um, in verse 6? Swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heavens and, and, and the things that are therein, the earth and the things that are therein, the sea and the things that are therein. Who is he? He's the creator. He's the creator of those things, okay? It is not an accident of evolution. It's not a, a result of some big bang, okay? The only big bang that there's ever been is when the people who dreamed up the Big Bang, the reason they did that is because their brain exploded. And so they came up with the Big Bang, basically. Folks, listen, the Big Bang never happened, okay? What it was is in the beginning, God created. 
He spoke the worlds into existence. That's what the Bible says. He spoke the worlds into existence. You might say, well, well did, it, did it begin with, a, with some sort of a, an explosion or, or this or that? Well, let me say this. None of us were there. But as far as just some accidental big bang taking place, you can just forget it. Now, I don't believe there was an explosion. Why? Well, because explosions bring chaos. They don't bring order. And our universe is a finely tuned machine. Finely tuned. The details of what it is and how things are, okay? The earth, the way the earth is, it's exactly where it needs to be. If it was closer to the sun, we'd be burned up. If it was further, we would freeze. It's all these kind of things, all detailed in a magnificent way. Isn't it amazing? Some of our planets have moons, and some of the moons go one way, and the other moons in the same planet go the other way. Now, that wouldn't be the case if it was the result of a big bang. Everything would be going the same way, right? No. Why? How can it be that way? Let's see. Okay, that, that's not too bad. How can it be that way? Now, I know every one of you does that at home. You just won't admit it, okay? You've wondered about that. How does that work? Um, how, could it, how can this be this way? Well, because God made it. See, it's not complicated. Oh, I don't think I have that much faith. What? It's easier to believe that than to believe nothing created everything. Listen, nothing can't create anything because nothing has no attributes. Do we get that? How can anybody believe that everything came from nothing? Nothing can't do anything because it doesn't have any attributes. Nothing is nothing. There's zero. There's nothing. No, a, an intelligent being brought it all into existence, and that being is God, okay? Not an accident of evolution. You cannot have it both ways, by the way. People say, well, I believe in theistic evolution. No, you can't really believe in theistic evolution. That doesn't work either. You see, if the Bible is true, evolution is a lie. If evolution is true, the Bible is a lie. This is why there is, there is such a fierce battle between the two. Okay? I don't know if I, if I gave this to you uh, as far as projection, but look... Uh, look with me to Exodus chapter 20. Look with me to Exodus chapter 20. Well, wait a minute now. You don't, you're not one of those young earth people, are you? Yes? Well, how can you believe that? Because that's what the Bible says. Well, but you know, you know uh, those, those days, what about there in Genesis? You know, the days could be ages and all this. Well, no, no. Now, if God didn't tell us anything better or clearer, maybe we might want to bark up that tree. But you know what? We don't have to go there because God said, let me define to you exactly what I meant by days. Now, by the way, you can read Genesis chapters 1 and 2, okay? Uh, chapter 1, it's very clear that the evening, the morning and the evening were the first day. Well, Duh, just watch what we have, and what do we call these things that we pass by every 24 hours? They're called days. Guess what? Nothing has changed. That's still the same. But look at Exodus 20. Here you go. You might say, are those ages in Genesis 1, or are those literal 24-hour periods? Well, here in Exodus, it's talking about the Sabbath, keeping the Sabbath. It's talking about days. 24-hour days. The Sabbath is a 24-hour day, right? It's Saturday. By the way, the Sabbath is not Sunday. Did you know that? How many of you already knew that? Good. The Sabbath is not Sunday. The Sabbath is Saturday. The Sabbath has never been Sunday. The Sabbath will never be Sunday. We worship on Sunday because we're celebrating every time we get together on Sunday, we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's how that began, All right? But here in Exodus 20, verse 11, look what it says. For in six days, 
Now remember, in Exodus 20, the Lord is talking about specific 24-hour days. And then right into verse 11, for in six of those 24-hour days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and he rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now, how can you believe that the days in Genesis 1 are more than 24-hour days when here in Exodus it makes it clear that he's talking about 24-hour days? No, they're 24-hour days. How can you believe that? God said it. He was there. He did it. None of us were there. Well, that's, that takes faith. Yeah, everybody believes something. I'd rather believe the evidence than make something up, okay? Wouldn't you rather believe God than Little Red Riding Hood? Or the Big Bag Wolf? No offense. You probably get that all the time, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> Pastor Matt Wolf. Um, folks, listen. God did it just the way he said he did it. And more and more as time goes on, what are we finding? Everything the Bible says is true. Everything it says. You can believe it. I don't have a problem with it. Okay? Now you notice this. The Lord is the one responsible for the world and the universe we live in. But notice he, then he says this, time no longer. Literally, the word time means delay. In other words, what he's saying here is there's not going to be any more delay. The issue that the coming of Christ to set up his kingdom is soon coming is a fact. We know it. It's coming soon. Now, in the context of Revelation, it's, they're in the middle of the tribulation talking about when Jesus is going to come back and set up his kingdom. Remember, the rapture has already taken place if we're looking at it in a linear fashion. Now, it hadn't literally taken place in the days of John, but in, in, the, in the chronology, in, in the way Revelation is set up, as far as he's unfolding the future, the rapture has taken place, they're in a tribulation period, and he's saying, this is coming soon. Therefore, the consummation of the tribulation is soon, and that's seen at the end of chapter 11, as well as very, very clearly in chapter 19, the second coming of Christ to earth. Now, we talked about here in the text the mystery of God. The, the mystery of God being finished, I believe it refers to the remaining details of the tribulation. This is brought out in verse 11 when he says, prophesy again. Prophesy again. There's more to say on this. Now let's go back to chapter 10, verse 8. It says, And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it, here you go, Take it and do what? Eat it up. And it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand, and I ate it up. And it was in my mouth, sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. By the way, have you ever done that? You eat something you shouldn't? Maybe it's fruit that's not ripe yet or something like that. And, oh, this is not so bad. And then a little while later, ugh. The little book. Now, why is it bitter and sweet. I'll give you my thoughts on that. I believe it's sweet because it makes known the righteousness and the righteous judgments of God. And can I tell you, folks, if you love the Lord and you love God's ways and you love your heavenly Father, when it comes to his righteousness and his righteous judgments, those are sweet things to you. When I think that there's a day coming when God is going to execute vengeance and justice on the wickedness of this world, let me tell you something, that's, that's sweet music to my ears, you might say. That's sweet to me. As terrible as the tribulation is, man deserves every bit of the judgment that is going to come his way. The word of God is sweet. The promises of God are sweet in that they are trustworthy promises. Folks, this book is an amazing book. 
There's never been a book like it. There will never be a book like it. It endures forever. God has preserved it, and it will endure forever. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. Listen, this should be, if you're a Christian, this should be one of the priorities of your life to learn this book. And let me tell you something, it's going to be sweet to you as you learn it. You're going to find it a book of incredible promises and encouragement. But secondly, he said, he said it would be bitter. Why bitter? Well, I believe this. While John loved the Lord and his ways and justice, he was also a man as we are. And the truths which are yet to come, when truly thought about, in other words, when you think of what's coming on this world, could easily make you sick to your stomach. Have you ever seen people who have died, whether in natural disasters or war, or I've, I've seen pictures, as probably most of you have, of Jews who had been killed in mass during the Holocaust, and you see those piles of bodies, starved human beings, and you know what? You look at that, and what can it do? It can make you sick to your stomach. I think John, when he realized what was coming, it made him sick to his stomach. See, there will be much suffering and ultimately hell itself for those who reject Jesus Christ. But let me make a, you might say, a point of application here in our last section. And it is this, the Word of God in general is sweet in that it provides eternal life and blessings in this life. The Word of God sustains us. Yet it would seem, as true as that is, sadly to say, it would seem that a lot of Christians are on a starvation diet. They say, what do you mean? I'm overweight. I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about spiritually. Folks, if the Word of God is sweet for us, if the Word of God is beneficial for us, then why in the world are we not taking advantage of this? You know, why do we give away Bibles here at church? And they're nice Bibles. They're just like the one I have, a little, little less expensive cover, but it's the exact same Bible as I'm using here. Why do we give these away to people? And some of those people will never see them again, but we give them a Bible. Why is that? Well, because we want them to have the most valuable possession that you'll ever have that you can hold in your hands. And that's a Bible. It's the Word of God. Turn with me over to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. The Bible contains something we call the gospel, which is, means good news, good news. And in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, it says this, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? Because that message of good news is the power of God unto salvation. This is how you get saved, is through this message of good news. Now, what is the good news? Well, can I tell you, before I tell you what the good news is, let me tell you what it's not. The good news is not that you have to live a life of good works and faithfulness if you're ever going to get to heaven. Because if that was the good news, it's bad news. Because there's not a person in this room or who will ever see this on the internet or hears my voice over radio could ever live a perfect life. And by the way, God requires sinless perfection for you to get into heaven. So when people start saying, well, you have to turn from all your sin, well, you have to uh, forsake all your sin, you have to reform your life, you have to promise God you're going to follow Him and live for Him, how many sins 
How long do we have to do it? Okay? How faithful do I have to be? Folks, ask these questions. None of these things will save you. It's not good news. That's bad news when you put that kind of stuff on man. But here's the good news. The good news is this. Because there's nothing we could do to save ourselves, God sent his son into the world. And Jesus went to the cross, and when he died on the cross, he paid for all of our sin. If this was you and me, and this is our sin, we're all sinners. We cannot get to heaven with even one sin. Not even one. Sin separates us from the Lord. To get to heaven, all your sin has to be gone. Now God says, if you die with your sin, you'll spend forever separated from God in hell. That is bad news. But it's true. But here's the good news. God so loved the world, and that's you and me, that he gave his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he went to the cross of Calvary, he came and he took our sin upon himself and he made the payment so that we don't have to he paid for all sin past present and future all of your sins been paid for through christ and he died and three days later he came back from the dead and here's what he says this is why it's good news i did all the work i'm simply asking you to trust in me that i did that for you and when you put your faith in jesus christ that he paid for all your sins The moment you do, he gives you everlasting life. He gives you a home in heaven for all eternity. That's good news. He'll never lose you. He'll never cast you out. That's good news. You might say, well, what if I misbehave? What if I turn my back? What if I do bad things? God doesn't want you to do that. But you know what? All of those things would be sin. How many of your sins did he pay for when he died on the cross? Paid for all of them. So there's nothing... That can keep you out of heaven once you've trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. Now, people will hear this message and you'll say, oh, I can't believe that. That's too easy. That's cheap grace. That's, that's you know, they've got all kinds of, uh, uh, some say greasy grace. That's a new one, greasy grace. Okay? You know what? I think that's disgusting to say something like that. Friend, let me tell you something. When Jesus shed his precious blood on the cross, it was to pay for all of our sin. That's not cheap grace. That's amazing grace that God would do that for you and me. We don't deserve it. We can't earn it. We can't qualify for it. All we can do is accept it. You trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. When you do, all your sin is taken away. He gives you everlasting life. You go to heaven on what Christ has done. That's good news. So my eternal security, my place in heaven is not based on how I perform. It's based on what Jesus did on the cross. I accept his payment as my payment. The moment I do, he gives me salvation. I'm saved and secure forever. I'm going to heaven when I die. That's good news. That's good news. And where do we find that? In the Bible. That's where we find it. This is a sweet book. This is a sweet book. And you know what? It's the gospel. The gospel's the same everywhere. Right, Pastor Matt? It's the exact same message they're preaching in the Philippines. There, uh, uh, the virginals, same message they're preaching. Quentin Rhodes, same message. Dr. Arnold down in Florida, same message. People we know all across the world preaching the same message, the gospel of grace, the good news of grace. Because it's not, if it's not by grace, we don't have a chance. But grace is free. Mercy there was great, and grace was free. Okay? Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty. Where? Calvary. Calvary. But you know what? Once you've trusted Christ the Savior, let me tell you this. Folks, that's just the beginning of the blessings and the joy and the sweetness of our salvation. Look with me over to Psalm 19. Psalm 19. And this is particularly important for those of us who are believers. I know for a fact, because it's human nature, I know for a fact, there are people here today, all right? Because we all have gone through times like this. There are people here today 
who you have a very difficult time getting into the Word of God. You can read magazines, you can read newspapers, you can read books, and you don't have any problem with that. But when it comes to opening up your Bible and reading it, there's some sort of a block there. You might say, what is blocking me? Why is that such a hard thing in my life? Well, I can give you two simple reasons. Number one, it's the devil doesn't want you reading the Word of God because you'll learn the truth there and the truth will make you free. And or it's your flesh, your old nature. The old nature hates the Bible. Did you know that? It hates the Bible. The old nature does not want you reading the Bible because what will happen is when we as believers get into the Word of God, we start reading it, we start studying the Bible... It's the great stabilizer of the Christian life. Friend, if you find your emotions all over the chart, all over the place, guess what? The Word of God will bring stability to your life. It'll help. The Word of God brings us hope. It revives us inside. There are, there are times, and all of us go through times like this, where we are kind of dehydrated spiritually. You know what I'm talking about. You're just kind of dry. You know what you go? Go to the water of the Word. Start drinking it in. You might say, well, how much of it do I have to read? Don't think about amounts. Just get in there. Saturate yourself with it. Get in there. Read it. Believe it. Study it. Memorize it. And watch what God does through that in your life as a believer. This is the greatest physical possession we have in the world. And by the way, I know that I already said that this morning. But it's that important. That's why I'm repeating it. Folks, this is a marvelous thing. Those of you parents and your children have Bibles, you teach your children to respect the Word of God, okay? And what I'm talking about is treat this book special. Don't throw it around. Don't throw it around. You wanna, if you've got golden books and you want to throw those around, throw those around. Well, probably not. You'll probably hurt somebody. But don't throw this around. This is the Word of God. Psalm 19, verse 7, the law of the Lord. Here's all kinds of names for the Scripture. The law of the Lord is what? Perfect. Can you get better than perfect? No. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul, turning the soul around. The testimony of the Lord is sure, Making wise the simple. See, when God speaks, that's what a testimony is, right? When God speaks, it is sure. You can count on it. You can bank on it. Okay, we we use the term, you can take that to the bank. Guess what? When God speaks, you can take it to the bank. It's a promise. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Don't you need wisdom? We all need wisdom, don't we? Isn't the uh, political race for president, isn't it an embarrassing thing? It's just embarrassing. You, you, you hear what they're saying to each other, and it's like, where has any sense gone in this country? Let's get back to this. Number eight, or verse eight, the statutes of the Lord are right. Rejoicing the heart. Well, I don't know what's right. What should I do? I want to do the right thing, but I'm not sure what it is. Get into the Scriptures. Get in there. Find out. The statutes of the Lord are right. Rejoicing the heart. Boy, don't you want a rejoicing heart? Instead of a broken one? I think a re- rejoicing the heart kind of sounds like the Word of God being sweet, doesn't it? The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Oh, I can see now. Now I understand. Yeah, Scripture does that. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold. Do you feel that way? I hope you do. Yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, and the honeycomb. Now look at verse 11. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, 
and in keeping of them there is great reward. Great reward. Do you believe that? I hope you do. Friend, this is one of the motivators in my life, the great reward part. Now, that's not carnal. God's the one who created that principle. There's great reward now and later to the one who embraces the Scripture and lives according to the Scripture as a believer. This is a wonderful, wonderful truth. Great reward. I love that. Now, let's go back to Revelation 10. Let's wrap this up. In verse 11, the last verse, it says this, And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. I believe that, that again prophecy, is what's in the little book. All right? By the way, the word again means a subsequent point of time involving repetition. A subsequent subsequent point of time involving repetition. What we have from this point on is a repeat of the tribulation period with with new details. As I mentioned back in chapter 6 when we started this section, some of the judgments overlap, and I believe some of the judgments are even the same. They're looking at it from different angles. We saw this last time with the sixth trumpet and the sixth bowl or vial judgments very very similar having to do with the euphrates river okay now we're going to close over in first john chapter 4 and in verse 9 and 10 and let me say this today i'm pleading with you dear friend i'm pleading with you if you do not know where you're going when you die you can get it completely settled today Here's the case. We're all sinners, including you. If your sins are not taken away and you die in that condition, you'll spend forever separated from God in hell. No second chances. No second chances. The only way you can have your sins taken away and have forgiveness and receive eternal life is by putting your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, not yourself not your performance, not your religion, okay? Your denomination will not help you get to heaven. I don't care what you are, whether you're Catholic, Methodist, Pentecostal, Baptist, anything, your denomination will not get you to heaven. Salvation is in a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to trust in Him as Savior. Look at the beautiful words of 1 John 4, 9, and 10. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation, the satisfactory payment for our sins. All you need to do is trust in Him as your Savior and He will give you everlasting life. You're saved forever. You become a child of God. You're sealed by and with the Holy Spirit. You're adopted into the family of God. You are forgiven. You're justified. You're sanctified. You're glorified all the moment you trust Christ the Savior. Now that's good news. That's sweet, isn't it? That's sweet. Well, friends, that concludes this edition of Voice of Assurance. Thanks so much for listening. And would you share this ministry with a friend? To contact us or learn more about our ministry, please visit www.northlandchurch.com. Your prayers and support for this ministry are greatly appreciated. Thank you so much, and God bless you.